I'm going to open the room and we'll be truly live. Okay. Welcome, friends. We'll get started in just a moment. We'll let that Zoom room fill up. And we want to welcome our friends on YouTube. And I'm going to start out with putting a link to tonight's event. This document contains library information and resources, as well as links to our presenters tonight. And if our presenters, which I'm sure they will, will have things come up, books come up, and I will try to capture that all in that one handy doc for you. And then you can also watch this again on YouTube. And welcome YouTube friends, and I will put that link in very soon. Um, one more fun thing to do while we wait for the seven o'clock and folks to get in is, if you know what native land you're joining us from today, you could put that in the chat. And if you don't know, I just put a link to native land map, which is pretty amazing resource. All right, seven o'clock, let's get that library info down. Um, welcome everybody. I'm guessing everyone can hear me and see me since I didn't ask that question and no one's like, mm -hmm. so if you can't hear me or you can hear me, let me know. Uh, happy Earth Day, yay. This is, a, you know, obviously climate change is huge and life is so traumatic and we are, you know, there and traumatized greatly, I know, as a community, but Earth Day always seems so happy to me. It reminds me of being a child, and I'm just so happy to have Jane Kim and Thea Walker of Ink Dwell Studio here tonight with us. Um, we want to welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people, and we want to acknowledge the many uh, Ramutush Ohlone tribal groups and families as rightful stewards in the lands of which we reside. SFPL is committed to uplifting the names of these lands and community members from these nations. We encourage you to learn more about first person culture, land rights, and we host many events. We have many events on our YouTube channel, check that out, and lots of educational resources. And I will, those are in that document that I shared. Uh, we also want to know that the library is open gosh, May 3rd, the main will be opening first floor limited services. So that's super exciting. But we do know we are still not safe and we are not all protected. So please protect my library family and the main and all the locations as we trickle open 16 locations, I think have pickup service. So what mask up protect everybody's family and friends and people that are serving out there. Uh, it is Climate Action Month, and we are partnering with the SF Environment on tomorrow at noon. We will have healthy homes in Spanish at noon. And Friday, no, 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 Saturday, 10 a.m., we are going to be having an amazing panel. I did a tech check with them this week, and they are all just amazing humans uh, talking about edible food recovery during COVID. Next week, we have... Uh, author, essayist, poet, Hanif Abderqweep, in conversation with our newest poet laureate, Tongo Eisen Martin, the 28th, discussing Abderqweep's book, A Little Devil in America, a partnership with Moad. And heading into May, we have so many events lined up. I represent the adult uh, community in our library, but uh, youth and adult and all ages, many programs celebrating AAPI including Richie Underberg, who doesn't like him, talking about Asian rock. And I'm just going to breeze through these ones, because, and I'll stop at some key ones that I'm really excited about. A uh, partnership with Kearney Street Workshop, author Muriel Luong will be talking about her new book, and we will have a group of poets reading. Uh, excited about this one, too. Tresse, an amazing graphic novel. And sort of the silver lining of pandemic world has been we get to bring people from all over the world, author uh, and artist joining us, one from Holland and one from the Philippines. And Tresse has just been optioned by Netflix. So you're going to hear about it if you haven't heard about it. Lots and lots of events. Um, Lewis, Dr. Lewis Gordon, Freedom, Justice and Decolonization coming up, partner with the Before Columbus Foundation. 
And Total SF, if you're not familiar with Total SF, it's a uh, Heather Knight and Peter Hartlob, the Chronicle event. And they are joining us for a quarterly book club, bringing the author, our first one, celebrating Aaliyah Voles and her book, Home Baked, My Mom, Marijuana, and the Stoning of San Francisco. This is a super fun book. Um, and yes, it's super fun because, you know, it's about marijuana, but it's also just loaded with um, SF history. So it's really amazing. Uh, she uses the library a lot to do her research. And we're really excited about this uh, book coming out. And her home bake just came out in paperback on 420. May will be celebrating Vanessa Hua. And we have a on the same page. It's called the bi-monthly read, where we encourage all of San Francisco to read the same book. And we are reading A River of Stars. I love this book. It's um, heavy topics, but uh, Hua has like such an amazing approachable sense and a little bit of humor. And again, it just hits in San Francisco. Uh, Chinatown Pretty, if you don't follow this Instagram, I encourage you to find this Instagram. Amazing Chinatown seniors, just the best socks ever. And uh, wisdom style from six different Chinatowns all over America. And all right. Enough of me talking. We're going to turn this over. In celebration of Earth Day, we have Jane Kim and Thayer Walker, uh, artist and writer, um, creators of Inkdwell Studios. Uh, Inkdwell explores the wonders of the natural world, merging classical techniques of science, illustration, and modern fine art. They create public and private commissions, illustrations, exhibitions, and much more. Jane Kim is a visual artist, science illustrator, and the founder of Ink Dwell. She received formal training from Rhode Island School of Design and then Cal State Monterey Bay, where she received her master's certificate in science illustration. Kim has created numerous large-scale public works, and in addition to Cornell Lab Ornithology, she has produced works for the National Aquarium, the De Young Museum, the Nature Conservatory, the Smithsonian, Tropical Research Institute, Facebook, Recology, I love Recology, and Yosemite National Park. She's the creator of Migrating Mural Campaign. Thayer Walker is a correspondent for Outside Magazine covering science, adventure, exploration, and the natural world. He's exploited the Cayman Trench in a homemade submarine, survived 20 days, stranded on a desert island, once escaped the jaws of a jaguar and discovered the 10th largest diamond ever found at Arkansas's Crater Diamond State Park. Together, they are the co-founders of Ink Dwell. Are you laughing at your own bio? <laughs> um, I, I love it though, it's, it's adventurous. Um, I was just telling Jane and Thayer that I moved recently to Bush Street, so I get the honor of seeing the migrating mural every single day. And it is, I love it. It's so powerful to see this beautiful mural just hovering over the tenderloin. It's a joy. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Jane Kim and Thayer Walker. Hi, sorry, just a little slow on my technical ability there. I had to unmute and then start our screen share. Um, hello. Hello. We are Inkdwell. I am Jane Kim. I'm Fair Walker. Uh, and together we tell stories that explore the wonders of the natural world, whether it is through words or through visual art. And we're going to share a little bit about the work that we do. Um, happy Earth Day, first and foremost. We couldn't be happier to celebrate with you all. Um, the, you know, we love the San Francisco Public Library. And the last time that uh, we gave a talk there, we were actually working on the mural uh, that Anissa was just talking about. And here is a great drone shot of this project, which I can't believe was already in year, October of 2019. Yeah. Um, so this feels like yesterday, but it wasn't. And we are so thrilled to speak to the public library community again this evening. 
Big shout out to Pavel Fedorov for that awesome drone shot too. And this amazing yeah. picture. Um, so it is now complete. This is just a, you know, uh, what direction is that? North? north? From here, from where? From the public library. This is the north facing wall. Yeah. Yes. Um, so it's just up the street on, on uh, oh, yeah, Hyde north Street, of north library. of the public library. Yeah just by a few blocks and we'll, we'll circle back around to this project. Um, but again, happy Earth Day. Uh, we couldn't be more thrilled to also be giving a presentation um, at the San Francisco Public Library. Well, not at, but you know, you know what I mean. With. With. Yes. Um, because uh, I'm sure many of you who are tuned in probably do know the history of Earth Day, but in case you didn't, uh, really, it came to be because of a book written by Rachel Carson called Silent Spring. And it was uh, through this book that issues of the environment were brought to a, a broad and public uh, forum. And it inspired people to, to get together. And um, Dennis Hayes organized the, the first Earth Day ever in 1970. Um, and this is a picture of a newspaper on the right-hand side of the next day. So you can see how many, and this is of New York, um, how many people turned out in support of the planet and a better relationship with it. And I just think that is remarkable. Um, you know, it's, it's funny how, when you start to think about how something like this can be organized, uh, you know, back in the day before the internet. And uh, really it's because of a mimeograph machine that predates the Xerox machine copier that they were able to create flyers, which brings me to a little bit of my own background in history. Um, I graduated from the Rhode Island School of Design with a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Printmaking. And, you know, one of the things that I love about printmaking is that with the invention of uh, woodblock techniques, engraving, and of course, movable type, um, you know, we were able to create books that could be mass produced and then shared broadly with the general public. And so that allowed information to be disseminated on a scale that it could never have been done before. And one of my favorite artists when I was a student at RISD was learning about Albrecht Durer. Um, and this is his infamous rhino. And if you didn't know the artist, I'm certain that you are probably familiar at least with this image. Um, it to date remains one of the most important uh, animal art renderings, um, I think, and that had the most influence and impact. Um, this was the image that everybody believed a uh, Indian rhinoceros to be. Um, so just below that is a picture of an actual Indian rhino. And he basically created this image from a description and a sketch. So I think that, you know, the role of art is pretty remarkable uh, in, in how we communicate and connect. And that leads me to my other um, academic endeavor, which was in scientific illustration. And that's through uh, scientific illustration and how it was integral to the age of exploration. Um, these are renderings from one of the first expeditions to Antarctica. Um, so it just, again, um, and, and I only share this because, you know, Inkdwell is a studio that shares stories, uh, especially that are tied to science and history. And so all of these things are quite important to Thayer and I as an art studio. Um, and then my aha moment came when I was down in Los Angeles visiting the La Brea Tar Pits at, and the Page Museum and saw this exhibit. Uh, and it's a permanent exhibit, so I, I believe it's still there. Um, but these gorgeous bird renderings behind articulated bird skeletons were just jaw dropping. I couldn't peel myself away from these cases. And it was that moment that I thought, man, that's what I wanna do. Um, I wasn't quite sure how I wanted to move forward in my art career, but this really you know, put that last nail in, in that coffin of doubt. Um, and I decided to, uh, to apply to the science <laughs> illustration program at CSUMB. Um, and lo and behold, after that, Inkdwell was, was created. And, I'm gonna let Thayer tell you a little bit about himself. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm not so uh, 
I'm not so handy with a paintbrush, but uh, I do okay with a with a pen and paper. Uh, I've been a correspondent for Outside Magazine for about 15 years and written for a slew of uh, slew of other publications um, and a, a couple of books. And um, yeah, I love to to write about exploration in the natural world. So you know, um, you know, Jane's. Uh, you know, Jane's um, um, visual art obviously dovetails pretty well with that. And, and just a few photos from some past assignments. This was actually on assignment with Biographic, uh, which is uh, a publication by our very own, San Francisco's very own beloved uh, California Academy of Sciences. Uh, this was a story, actually Jane did the illustrations for this story. This was in uh, uh, Kings, uh, King Can uh, Kings and Sequoia National Park, Kings Canyon and Sequoia National Park. Uh, that is atop a very large, uh, a very large sequoia tree called Franklin. Uh, uh, yes, we're not supposed to say that. Oh, but, uh, sorry, <laughs> my bad. Um, and uh, this is all, all done under scientific permit. Uh, but people like to go and poach these things, so you you know try and keep that under wraps. But um, this was a project that was actually all about how climate change uh, is impacting these grand old monarchs. Um, and you can actually see in the background there, you can see all the dead trees back there. Um, as a result of, uh, of um, beetle invasion and drought. Uh, and so that was a pretty spectacular view. This one, this next one was a, uh, this is actually, that's, that's not me. That's a guy named Mark Healy, uh, who's a professional waterman, surfer, uh, free diver, but I'm about maybe 40 feet above him in that frame. This photo was taken by a, a guy named Kanoa Zimmerman. And uh, this is off the coast of Japan. Uh, there is a, um, uh, a, a population of scalped hammerhead sharks that that uh, convenes there, uh, gathers there every every summer, uh, hundreds, thousands of them. No one really knows where they're going or what they're doing, and they're really hard to um, to study uh, because they don't like humans. They are very sensitive. You can't catch them on a on a line uh, and and tag them because they'll stress out and die. So the only way to actually tag these hammerheads is if uh you know a a, a a a you know a guy like uh mark healy is gonna swim down you know 80 100 feet free diving and actually spear them uh with a uh with a, with a, with a satellite tag so that's what that's what he's doing there that was for an outside story um and but it's not always so not always science sometimes you just do things for fun uh this was uh in my younger days in uh, in idaho at lower mesa falls um and that was really just for good fun um, which uh, leads us into speaking of good fun, the wall of birds here <laughs> and epic projects. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's Fair's idea of fun. I don't match that. <laughs> I would be terrified to be in that kayak. However, I'm not terrified to be very high up on scaffolding or in equipment or operate equipment for that matter. Um, so this project called the Wall of Birds at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York. Um, it lives in the visitor center and celebrates the diversity and evolution of birds uh, through 243 families and several other species that make up the evolution of birds um, on a 70 by 40 foot wall. Um, I'm just gonna switch over here to a different screen so that we can get intimate with the wall of birds hey, and right, right up and close right up close to it it's a digital interactive so you can go ahead and google a uh, wall of birds interactive and you should be able to find this pretty easily um but i i think you can see the url here Th this was actually so so this this uh mural took jane uh what two and a half years to complete it was eight, 18 19 months on site and a year off site uh but this actually this composite image um was put together it's 700 plus individual photographs that were stitched together uh, by the cornell lab team and um and it's sort of like Google Maps for the Wall of Birds. It took them six months to put this thing together, but it's been an incredible way for the, the project to, to live on, uh, both in a physical and here in a digital space. So what I'm doing is just moving through it like Google Maps. And you can, uh, you can see that I'm zooming in, zooming out. Um, but each bird is hyperlinked. And when you click on a bird, you can, of course, learn about its specific species. You can, you know, 
tell the world that you love this bird. If they have a recording of its call, you can listen. So, so because this is the San Francisco Public Library, I think this actually this bird has a, a very a, a very funny story. So the yellow billed magpie is is uh, uh, part of the Corbin family. Uh, which is an iconic family of birds. You've you know probably seen the crows and the ravens all around San Francisco, but it's got you know blue jays, it's got jays and, and magpies, and so there was a lot of discussion about which uh, representative from the Corbin family would make it onto the wall of birds. This was a very heated discussion, <laughs> and Jane finally she kind of stayed out of uh, you know of, of the ornithological decisions, but when it came to choosing the Corbin, she said, we need to get California's own yellow-billed magpie and put them, put them right there. So that's how we got, that's how we got the magpie in. And they said, okay, said, so okay. We, we won that one. Yep. Um, anyway, so the, uh, you can learn about the families of the, of the bird that it belongs to and also see um, the eBird data. And this is a citizen science tool where you can record uh, your sightings and observations and just an amazing uh, application if you haven't heard of that. Um, I'm going to switch back over to the presentation. Okay. There we go. I think we're back. Oh, there we go. Um, and, one, um, you know, it's not often that Thayer and I actually get to work together on something. So um, this was actually quite special, uh, I think, for both of us. And it is our book called The Wall of Birds, and it tells the story. It tells, vignettes, yeah, yeah of, of the project. Tells the story of the, of the project, um, and there's a lot of natural history in there. Jane has a lot of her own sort of art, art theory and philosophy in there. There's, um, you know, some incredible color theory and behavior. Yeah, it's just a, a really, actually, there was one review that actually said they weren't sure how to uh, classify this book, which we kind of took as a compliment. Yes. So um, it's kind of got a bit of everything. If you love, uh, you know, if you love art, if you love birds, you love the natural world, um, you know, you'll, you'll probably enjoy this. You can check if you go to the wall you can find some links to, to, to pick it up. Or if you go to the San Francisco public library, I think they even have it there too. They do. They do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you guys. Shout out. Um, so our work, focuses around a lot of different disciplines. You know, we, we don't just do one thing, we do many things. Um, but a lot of what we do is working with institutions um, and uh, universities and, and museums to create interpretive backdrops and displays and illustrations. So one of these such projects is at the National Aquarium in Baltimore, Maryland. And this is this was created in 2015 mm -hmm. and it's a permanent exhibit called Living Seashore and it is a tactile experience. So um, everything that we created, the, that that mural in the background is done with uh, hand cut pieces of tissue paper that were then glued to the wall to add to the tactile nature of the exhibit. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. I'm just going to quickly go through these slides. Uh, one of the projects, pro most recent projects that we finished is at Occidental College, and this is the Moore Lab of Zoology, and below is a Vantuna research group, and the top level is the study of birds, and the bottom level is the study of fish. Um, and so we wanted to connect these two spaces by uh, through this mural by showcasing land and sea. And all of the species that were selected were, of course, relevant to the research that's happening in these respective institutions. Um, this is at the Jones Beach Energy and Nature Center in Long Island, New York. Just a few slides from that. And then here in San Francisco, we have um, several interpretive signs that you can see uh, through, um, thank you, thanks to Sutro Stewards. So Sutro Stewards not only manages the Mount Sutro and those trails, but they also uh, plant native gardens 
throughout the cityscape. So right below UCS, uh, on the streets of UCSF campus, um, you might come across some of these signs and the respective gardens. Uh, we can create anything from children's workbooks. This was done for NOAA, um, for a, a collection of atolls um, called Papa Hana Mokuakea. <laughs> Papa Hana Mokuakea, that is a mouthful. Um, and then we we're so thrilled to work with uh, nature um, in the city to produce this uh, ecological map of San Francisco. And then one of my favorite projects uh, that I look forward to every season is producing the seasonal almanac for Bay Nature Magazine. I also create personal works. Um, I'm represented by Andrew Norris Gallery in Burlingame. And you know this allows me to maybe dive even further into some of the subjects that we work on, uh, we work around and with and on um, and, and create even more nuanced stories. Um, this was when I was at the De Young Museum as an artist in residence. Um, the show was called Non-Native and it was exploring native, non-native uh, relationships, not only um, in nature in Golden Gate Park, but also uh, using that as metaphor for, you know, the so sociological and cultural non-native native battle that, uh, you know, as we know, happens here in San Francisco. Wait, we should tell them. This is actually too good. I'm gonna, we're going to go back. I okay, love, okay. You, you should okay. tell the stories, especially prime real estate here, because this is a great, this is a great story that I think a lot of San Franciscans will relate to. Okay. All right. Well, um, so the map that you see there um, is a historical map of land uh, plots. Um, this is the image on the right, squirrel image. The it's squirrel, called prime yeah. Real estate. It's yeah. called prime real estate. And it shows that the original, I guess, land division of home sites um, in San Francisco. And, you know, Golden Gate Park is completely fabricated. It's absolutely man-made. And in the 1890s, um, you know, we, we used to not have any gray tree squirrels um, and not we have Western gray tree squirrels, but not the ones that we see in the park that that like to you know, be fed by humans. Um, they literally shipped Eastern gray tree squirrels to the park and released them so that people had squirrels to feed because our ground squirrels, you know, of course, were considered pests and eradicated. Um, so they're being delivered in an Amazon Prime box and the, the native ground squirrel is, is looking quite alarmed at this explosion of Eastern gray tree squirrels about to invade. Um, this piece is called uh, RG Bird. And it's about the pigment blue and how it actually does not exist anywhere in the avian world, which is still, you know, I hear that and I am told this and I understand the science of it, but it still doesn't stick as a possibility or a reality. But these are um, indigo buntings and uh, you, the, what we see is only perceived because of the way that the light hit, hits the feathers and, um, it's structural coloration and in different light, it will appear different shades of blue. Um, so I'm playing with that uh, idea of perceived color. Here's a little, um, I forgot I included this slide. I should have had this up while I was explaining, my bad. And here I am working for a sense of scale and this was uh, when I was an artist in residence at the Liaki Woodson Art Museum in Wausau, Wisconsin. And I'm very excited to announce that I have a show opening uh, next Friday um, at Palette SF, Palette Gallery. It's on um, Folsom and Fourth Street. It's called Poach Pruned and Peeled. And this show explores our relationship uh, to food and our hopefully relationship to nature through food. So hope if you can, um, please join us. I'll show this slide again, if you all wanna write down the, the link to RSVP. It's of course being COVID respectful and has limited capacity.
And here's a couple of close-up slides of this painting, which is called Engineered. So I think one of the main things that Inkdwell does is create public art. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for why we landed in that particular uh, technique and medium. Um, you know, one of them being, it's an ancient art form. Um, you know, I think that there's something very human about wanting to adorn the walls that are important to us with imagery that's important to us. Um, and so, you know, since modern man was walking the planets, we have art on walls. And of course, you know, in buildings, interiors, creating imagery in places uh, that have relevance and special meaning, um, you know, that's of course a practice that we all um, can relate to. Um, here's an image of the Sistine Chapel. And then right here in San Francisco, we have a, a number of WPA murals. Um, this is from Coit Tower. And I just think it's remarkable that that era, um, you know, one of the ways that they stimulated the economy was to hire artists to beautify spaces. Um, if you haven't looked up the story of these specific WPA murals in Quit Tower, I really recommend doing so because they were uh, quite, what's the word, uh, controversial. Um, in fact, that they weren't even unveiled uh, at the time that they were supposed to be because there was so much controversy uh, around some of the depictions in the mural, uh, especially around what seemed like pro-communism um, slogans or imagery. And it just dovetailed the incident of uh, Diego Rivera's mural at the Rockefeller Center and um, that being destroyed over, you know, the artist's refusal to take some imagery out that the, um, commis the commissioned sponsor wanted removed. So yeah, I mean, murals are a great way to communicate broadly um, things that are and right here and right now. Um, this is by an artist named JR at the border wall. Uh, he's a, photo a French photographer. I think what, uh, and we might get to this later, but I, I think what you'll notice, especially in those last three images of murals, is these are um, public works, uh, mostly of hu uh, depicting humans. And um, we're obviously taking a very, a very different, um, a different approach to that. Through our migrating murals. Yeah, so the, the, one of the big ideas of the migrating murals, and just dovetailing on that, on that topic of, of, of subjects is, you know, we create a lot of monuments. You know, we create all sorts of monuments as a society. We create monuments to, to political leaders, to social leaders. We create monuments to, to wars and war heroes, to athletes. Um, you know, we still have monuments to Confederate leaders that fought against the ideals of this country that are, that are scattered throughout the country. Um, and so in, in creating the Migrating Mural, you know, we really developed this because we believe that um, there's a necessity to create urban monuments that celebrate and focus on the wonders of the natural world and to really make these, you know, these topics, these ideas, these neighbors of ours that are easy to ignore, I mean, easy to overlook, um, to make them impossible to, to ignore. Yeah, thank you, yeah. absolutely. So um, when we created the Migrating Mural, we, we always envisioned it being a, a serial um, work of art that could include a number of different species and a number of different places. Um, and we had this vision of doing land, sky, and sea and so our very first series highlights the Sierra Nevada bighorn sheep and our sky series highlights the monarch butterfly. So we're just gonna um, share, share uh, some slides of these particular installations. So if you've never been to the east side of California, um, there is a highway 
Highway 395. It, it connects um, the basically the whole Sierra range, um, you know, from Tahoe all the way south to Lone Pine, California. Um, and you know, these are the entry points to Mammoth and Death Valley, um, to Bristlecone Pine National Forest. Uh, so when you exit the east gate of Yosemite National Park um, at, at Tuolumne Meadows, you are spit out onto what's called Tioga Pass. And if you take Tioga Pass down, you end up at Levining. Um, and that's where uh, one of the murals can be seen. So there's six unique murals along this highway stretch. It's 125 miles. And it is the length of the Sierra Nevada Sheep Bighorn, uh, Bighorn Sheep Range. Um, we actually have three different subspecies of bighorn here in the United States. We have the Rocky Mountain Bighorn, the Desert Bighorn, and the Sierra Bighorn. Um, and the Sierra Bighorn has a pretty tumultuous story. Um, in the 1990s, um, they were almost completely wiped out due to domestic sheep disease and their population dropped to just over a hundred sheep or so. And there have been a lot of efforts to recover this population. And now they're at about 600. Uh, we're hoping that that continues to rise, but it takes quite a bit of management. And, you know, even people who live in this area are probably never going to see a bighorn sheep just on their own. Um, so really we wanted to, uh, to celebrate this animal and bring it to the street level and show that these mountains are filled with sheep that have been there for, for millennia. Um, so that's, I hope that's what that has yeah, done. Um, did you want to add? Yeah, I was just going to say, as we, as we talk about Earth Day, and usually it's, it's a time to, you know, obviously celebrate what we have, but also to, um, to, to reconsider some of our, our, our choices and behaviors. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that, that I love most about this bighorn story is that it really is a story of success. Um, this is a, a distinct subspecies of bighorn. Um, they're only found in the Sierra Nevadas. They're like as Jane said, their numbers were, were, were down to a hundred or so, you know, just about 30 years ago. And um, now they're, they're back on the rise. They're on the path to being delisted. Um, and, and there's, there's plenty of terrain for them. There's plenty of habitat for them. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a great example of how, if we just kind of can take a step back and give, you know, give nature, a, you know, a chance to kind of, you know, breathe, um, and, and, and recover, um, you know, she's very resilient. So, um, you know, it's, it's incumbent on us to just kind of make the right decisions, uh, not only for the, the natural world, but ultimately for ourselves and, and these big horn and, and the, you know, the scientists that are, are working to, to help it recover are really a, a testament to that. Yeah, for sure. And that's really one of the things that we also love about what we do is working in, coll uh, in collaboration with or different organizations. And for this project, um, not only did we work with the Sierra Nevada Bighorn Sheep Foundation, but we were lucky enough to work with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Bighorn Sheep Recovery Program that they have there. Um, this was our first mural in Independence, California at the Mount Williamson Motel. And it was a great way to start the project as this particular herd unit, the Mount Williamson herd unit, uh, was one of the original herd units that did survive the almost um, extinction of their species. Um, this is at the Mono Basin Visitor Center. And mountain lion predation is actually a quite a problem um, when you know a population has as small a number as the bighorn sheep does, a mountain lion kill um, is pretty detrimental. Um, so that's one of the things that has to be managed in bighorn sheep conservation. And this little yearling is um, at the uh, Lone Pine Regional Airport on a, on a hangar that faces Highway 1, or Highway 395. Sorry, I'm just so used to saying one. <laughs> um, and then when we um, moved on to our second species, um, you know, we chose, we, we had a hard time picking who Sky was. Um, obviously, my relationship to birds, there's, I, I mean, 
yeah, thousands of species that we could have chosen. Um, but ultimately we landed on the monarch butterfly uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, but one, it's national. Um, you know, it can be found in almost all the lower 48 plus Canada and Mexico. So really it's a North American species. Um, we loved that the actionable, uh, the, the call to action for this particular species is quite easy. Um, you know, planting uh, native nectar pr producing flowers and milkweed is one of the best ways that anybody and everybody can get involved. So again, we um, really liked that aspect of the story. And then, you know, just culturally, the significance of the monarch butterfly um, is, is profound. And, um, you know, we wanted to honor that as well. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, this is uh, kind of an opposite story of the, of the, the Sierra bighorn. So, um, you know, Butterflies by the billions um, roamed across North America, flew across North America and this continent, Mexico, um, for ever, um, and and their numbers have just dropped precipitously in the last you know forty years or so. Um, in the West, so there's two populations and the same species, but they're sort of distinct populations. Um, here in California and the West, we have the Western monarch, uh, and we've seen them drop from. Uh, four and a half million back in the 80s to actually that even that 2018 number now. Is, oh, yeah, that was another slide. Yeah. I'll, I'll share that. We'll get later. Yeah. But uh, this last count last year, it was um, under 30,000. No. Yeah. That was 2019. Oh, wow. Counts. So 20, 20 counts 3, with 2000. 2000. 2000. 2000. Yeah. So um, not, not looking so good for our, our Western monarchs. Um, and, you know, the Eastern, the Eastern monarch population um, has always been bigger. Um, and it fluctuates quite a, quite a bit. Um, it's, you know, it's actually so sizable that they measure it by, by the acreage that they cover down in their wintering sites in Mexico rather than by the numbers. But, but even that acreage number has fallen precipitously uh, in the last 30 years or so. Um, so, you know, pesticide use, is, pesticide use land management um, are, are two major major um, components to that. So, you know, when you, and, and you know, when you, when you, you know, uh, uh, are working in your garden or thinking about what to plant, um, you know, always thinking, thinking native uh, plants are always best in part because they're resilient and don't necessarily need the, the types of, of pesticides or chemical, you know, treatments that, that invasive or, or non-native plants would need. So um, you think about it when you go to the store, when you go to your gardening centers, um, you know, you know, if people stop buying this stuff, then they'll stop making it. Um, so keep an eye out for that and, um, and, and plant native when, when and wherever you can. Yeah, so we're just gonna quickly um, show the series of uh, monarch migrating murals. Our first one was in uh, Springdale, Arkansas in 2017. This piece is called Kaleidoscope. Um, that's actually what a group of butterflies is called. It's called a kaleidoscope. I thought that was so beautiful. And then our next one, um, this is called Milkweed Galaxy. It's at Full Sail University uh, in Winter Park, Florida. And once again, um, you know, the, these projects aren't done in isolation. It takes a lot of uh, collaboration and um, individual effort and um, commitment. Uh, and we were really grateful to work with the Nature Conservancy and the, the Florida chapter of Nature Conservancy to bring these murals to not only Winter Park, Florida. Oh, I just want to note that um, in these collaborations, too, we really can make an a immediate difference. And Full Sail decided to re-landscape the whole front of that building and plant milkweed and weeks later uh, monarch butterflies were showing up and caterpillars were munching on all, all these milkweeds if you plant it they will come yeah for real <laughs> and then um in orlando florida uh we created this piece called midnight dream and i'm just gonna um give a little another scale picture because it was hard to tell how how big some of these pieces are um, we did a wonderful little mini mini mural with some students of SF Day School. And this piece is called Inching Forward. 
And we provided the caterpillar template, but um, they learned all about the native milkweed here in um, San Francisco and the Bay Area. And by looking at references, they each uniquely created milkweed for the mural. Um, this piece is called Life Cycle. It's at the Ogden Nature Center in Ogden, Utah. Um, so Ogden was really a cool uh, and unique city to work with in that there are three unique installations um, to support not only the natural history of monarch butterflies, but to also support Ogden's efforts to um, bring art to their city um, through something called the Nine Rails Creative District. So we partnered with Weber State University's art department and um, Ogden 01 Arts to bring uh, these three and then Ogden Nature Center to bring these three installations together. And so as such, um, Inkdwell is also very much focused on um, you know, real-time site-specific stories. And so because we had this opportunity to also tell a story of art, um, I decided to highlight a couple of different art movements that I, um, you know, I'm, I'm, have a particularly strong relationship to. And um, as you might notice, this feels very much like um, the arts and crafts movement. And it was inspired by William Morris and the wonderful uh, way that he brought nature into homes. And then this is called Monarch and Moda. And it was inspired by the 1960s op arts movement. And I was looking at the spots of the monarch butterfly um, and it's beautifully graphic nature and um, using that as a, a device to create movement in this dot pattern. This is, uh, are we going to the next? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah so another picture for scale. This is, I, this is, I, I love, I love this, um, this partnership here. So, um, this is a great example. You can, you can obviously, obviously see, we really just put the artwork on a shoe. Um, and uh, Le Mondeur is, uh, is, is the brand that we, we partnered with here. Uh, they make incredible shoes. And is there, is there another photo of them in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and I think one of the reasons why I think both of us really like this project is because, you know, um, this concept of, of, you know, embracing nature and telling, telling nature stories, you know, for some reason or another, it's, um, you know, I think for a long time, at least, and maybe still it's sort of been attached to this kind of like crunchy, hippie, sort of almost kind of dismissed as like a sort of a dismissed vertical amongst, um, you know, I think maybe just sort of mainstream culture or, you know, even, even more, you know, academic or fine art culture. And I think in, in doing, you know, in the shoe and the work that we do and, and, and bringing this type of work into other mediums, I think what we're really trying to, to, to show is that, you know, you know, nature is the best artist that we've ever seen. It's edgy, it's, um, it's cool, it's innovative. It really pushes um, the boundaries in terms of, you know, what we would even think is possible and really defines, um, you know, our own, um, you know, our, our own aesthetics. And so, you know, in, in doing things like this, and, and we're going to be doing more of these, these types of things like this to come, you know, we're really trying to highlight, um, you know, not just how Im important the natural world is for, for, you know, our general existence, um, but also to really celebrate, um, you know, just a, an absolutely incredible design, design aesthetic. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. And that it's in everything. I mean, you can give me any topic and I can trace it back to its origins to nature. Yeah. <laughs> um, and here's the piece at Weber State University. And of course, as a scientific illustrator, um, you know, the style of, of pen and ink drawing, um, I had to, I had to acknowledge. So here's the other side. And these are um, some wildflowers of the Wasatch range. Oh, yes. And another cool thing, yeah. Weber, Weber State also not only um, created a uh, garden in their sculpture, 
but they planted two acres, two acres. of milkweed on yeah. their campus, which is just awesome. And on that on that note, for those for those uh, city dwellers who are are watching this, and and also uh, you know non city dwellers, but um, you know Jane, as Jane mentioned, there's it's this is one of the reasons why we chose the monarch, and, and the monarch represents kind of all of you know all of pollinators. The monarch itself is not the best pollinator, but they certainly do it. But they're a great ambassador for for all of pollinators. And if you, you know, if you want to help and be a part of it, it really is as simple as, you know, putting a planter box of, of native wildflowers, nectar producing wildflowers outside of your window or on your roof. You know, if you have, you know, five square feet of space, you know, outside, you can create an ecosystem and a habitat that will uh, draw in, you know, animals like this. Absolutely. Um, and to that point, um, some of my most recent migrating murals for the monarch butterfly are right here in San Francisco. Um, so this is at 943 Howard Street. It's between 5th and 6th and Soma. Um, and this being home, of course, I expanded the story to also include the different families of butterflies that you can um, find here and, and, and specifically in San Francisco. Um, so we have the skippers and whites and brush-footed butterflies and uh, gossamer winged butterflies and swallowtails represented here um, in Phacelia cal uh, leaves. And then back to um, this piece, uh, Le Papillon is what we call 455 Hyde Street now, but each mural has its own title. Um, this side is called One Monarch. And it wraps around to the front. It's not a bad city, is it? <laughs> no, I mean, and this is really one of those good looking, good looking spot. It's a good looking spot. And one of yeah. one of the things that I think for me um, is quite emotional is that you know, Thera mentioned the idea of creating monuments to wildlife. And you know, when we were doing this project or began this project and we understood that the numbers were dropping quite rapidly in San Francisco or in, in the West for the Western population. You know, one of the things I kind of hoped it never would be is an actual monument to a species gone. Um, and we're coming dangerously close to that. And um, it's heartwarming to at least know that this, this piece is here and it has in fact changed the skyline of San Francisco. Um, and that collectively what monuments also say is that we residents of San Francisco care about this particular topic and this thing that's being memorialized. So we're not thing, this animal that's being memorialized. And then on the opposite side um, is a piece called Butterflies and Poppies. And it, this title was inspired by a painting um, by the same name that uh, Vincent Van Gogh did. And then the front, um, I'm going to show you a very special gift that the residents get to see. And, um, and unfortunately, um, this part isn't quite public, but you can see aspects of it, uh, is a hand-painted wall covering um, that actually shows all the 34 species of butterflies that have most recently been observed. And um, I used iNaturalist and uh, the help of experts and friends. Uh, Liam O'Brien is definitely one of uh, those um, folks who has devoted his life to observing um, butterflies of the Bay Area. And we took that same design and digitized it and created a vinyl wall covering for the garage door of 455 Hyde Street. And here's a few details. That's the tortoise shell, a California sister with uh, the mytilla and field crescent below it and a fiery skipper. So that slide that was already very discouraging of that Western monarch population um, dropping to 30,000, you know, um, in the 19, in 2019 has dropped to 2000 in the 2020 count. Um, you know, so on this Earth Day, I think 
one of the things that I'm really thinking about and will continue to think about is our relationship to this planet and how to improve it so that we might come to a place of equal reciprocity and that we give it something as much as it gives us, which is tall order, but I think can be done. Yeah, and, I, and actually, um, if you want to just go back there for a second, oh, sure. um, you know, if you want to know how you can get involved and, and um, you know, help pollinators and other invertebrates, uh, our conservation partner is an organization called Xerxes, uh, the Xerxes Society, which is the largest and oldest um, conservation organization focused on invertebrates in the world. If you go to Xerxes.org, they've got tons of materials in there, uh, what you can do locally, what you can do nationally, become a member, sign up, join them, show them some love. Um, they're on the ground, they're doing hard science, they're doing, um, you know, communication. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a great organization to look into if you're, if you're passionate about um, life on, on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking, um, speaking of life on earth speaking of life on earth you know another reason why we do what we do and love the format of of public art is that we do very much believe that it can help lift um nature blindness um i don't know if you guys can uh spot the alligator in this photo but man nature is really easy to overlook and and, and ignore and i have found myself guilty of it and um, i hate it when it happens but you know sit still next to a tree for, you know, five minutes and you'll hear birds calling in it and uh, just listen for the sounds of life. Um, and, you know, really one of the things that they also mentioned earlier was to make these overlooked uh, animals and make them hard to ignore through these big public art installations. So we just recently returned from Houston, Texas, um, where we, created a, a new mural, a public art mural for the Houston Parks Board. Um, and, and it was a really wonderful, again, collaboration of a lot of different organizations that came together. Um, but over the last five years or so, Houston Parks Board, Parks Board has brought um, bike paths and uh, walking paths along the city's bayou system. Um, so right at the center of downtown Houston um, is a confluence of a, something called Buffalo Bayou and White Oak Bayou. And not only is this a confluence of actual waterways, but this was where Houston began. And it was the, the location where port the, the port was so that shipping um, shipments would come through there and all the, all the ships would come through this little port. And then behind that was the railway system. Um, and so this is, truly at the confluence of the creation of Houston as a city. Um, but Houston is also one of the most diverse um, cities in the United States. And it also is the place for migratory birds. It has some of the most diverse populations of migratory birds that come in. And so as such, this mural confluence uh, highlights six species, migrating species um, on the left hand side are there, they are male birds are represented in their breeding plumage and on the right hand side, um, the same birds in their non breeding plumage because these six in particular have a pretty significant contrast between the different seasons. Um, and behind them is a map of Buffalo Bayou um, that creates the backdrop. And then on the left hand side, uh, we have three representations of birds that migrate to Houston to breed and nest. And then on the uh, right-hand side, what are called winter species. So we're telling the full seasonal story of migration um, on this wall called confluence. And as, as Jane mentioned, you know, it's, it's what we're, you know, we're doing here. The, the, the most obvious thing that we're doing here is we're telling a story of, 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 of avian diversity and, 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 you know, beautiful, different colors and, um, and and how important that is. But I think as we, as we're looking, you know, it, it's, it's a much bigger metaphor. Um, you know, I mean, diversity is the building block of, you know, a healthy ecosystem. Uh, healthy ecosystems are, are based on diversity and the more diverse those ecosystems are, the more successful and productive they are. And I think through all the, the through line through all of this work is that that is not just related to, you know, 
the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees that's related to, to, to all of us as a society. So when we see this and we, we you know, embrace this diversity, um, you know, we're challenging people also to kind of think a little bit broader than, than you know, just beautiful birds on a wall. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, and here I am again for scale. I like showing these scale pieces because it's really hard to picture, you know, what size we're painting at. And this is a Missi the, Mississippi kite. My favorite, my favorite part too, just that nature is this grand designer. It's just who would have thought to put a red eye on this bird? You know, I love, I just love that the Mississippi kite has a red eye. It just kind of makes the whole, makes the whole bird just look so compelling. Yeah, it's really fun when someone says, oh, I love the colors. I was like, well, I didn't pick them. <laughs> That's just the way they look. Um, I, I really do love answering it and that way. Um, so once again, I hope that you um, can attend uh, my new opening at Palette Gallery in, um, on Friday, April 30th from 5 to 8 p.m. Poach Pruned Peeled. Um, that concludes our presentation yeah. and we are very excited to answer any questions you all may have. Hi, it's Anissa here. So there is a question, it's a fun one too from, um, it's in the Q&A function. Do you wanna see it or do, would you like me to just read that out loud? Oh, let's see, yes, here we go, yeah. Michaela. Is that, is that Michaela? Is that what we? Yes, that's the one. Okay. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, can everybody see these or should I? Should <laughs> I, I don't know. No, no. Uh, Michaela's Mika Mika on the hustle. Okay, Michaela, yeah. I appreciate <laughs> I, I we, we appreciate that. Um, you know what? Uh, you can see the contact page there. Feel free to feel free to reach on, reach on out to us and, and drop us a line with, uh, with any questions or if you want to send a portfolio through, um, uh, go for it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Inspiring artists. Yeah. And amazing. Good. amazing appreciate, I appreciate the hustle. <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions, YouTube, now's your time. And anyone in the audience, there's another one. Uh, the murals make... with the dots, Monarch and Moda. The Monarch and Moda is in Ogden, Utah. And you know, if you go to, um, if you go to our website, you go to inkdwell.com, we just updated it. Um, so it's, it's just about, um, it's just about current. Um, and so all of there's tons of information on all the projects we walked through just now and, and more. And I'll just remind folks that the main link that I put in this doc tonight, the event links, this has on, like I thought they gave us, Lots of resources tonight. So I tried to keep up and they're all there and you'll get a reminder and you can watch this again on YouTube. Right. That's awesome. Um, lots of thank you. Any YouTube, some YouTube love. Last call for questions, friends. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, um, San Francisco Public Library and Anissa and uh, everyone for for joining here. Uh, it's always a always a pleasure to share our work, and it's always a pleasure to to work with the the public library. We're we're big fans and big uh, big big and frequent users. Yay! <laughs> yeah, we yeah. love to hear heavy users of the library. Yeah, I think yeah. I owe you guys a book. Actually, I need to. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah. Sorry. They might owe you more than yeah. that. No, just one. It's only one. Oh, okay. only one. Okay. Yeah, That's we are fine free, and we. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it, it was just absolutely thrilled to share our work with you tonight. And thank you so much for tuning in. Yep. Thanks a lot. Good night. Good night. We want to thank the San Francisco Department of the Environment for co-sponsoring tonight's event. And yay, thank you, Jane and